Thank you uh, to the Center for inviting me to talk to you about this project. It's near and dear to my heart. Jerry and I have been long-term uh, co-authors, and he joined me at the commission uh, and worked on risk assessment. And so how do we use scarce government resources to identify different types of risks? Now, this one, of course, is in the financial sector, which the SEC does not um, oversee. But I think that you'll appreciate that this could be used, um, hopefully you can see how this methodology can be used in other contexts to determine emerging risks. Uh, this uh, research was made feasible by an NF NSF grant that was joint with the Office of Financial Research. It was developed to help prudential supervisors know better where to spend their resources in surveilling the financial sector. And so, as a great segue from this panel that we just heard, where the topic was that we don't always know where the next crisis is going to come from, is there any way that we can give uh, researchers and regulators a more powerful tool to understand when risks are building up within the banking and financial sector? So there have been an, uh, a lot of papers since the financial crisis. Not surprisingly, it's been a boon to academic research. There are a number of metrics that have tried to quantify the buildup of risk, most importantly, systemic risk. And I'm going to be very careful here to let you know that we're not necessarily looking at systemic risk. We're hoping that the identification that we do will help stave off any type of systemic event, because regulators and banks can intervene before it becomes problematic. So for those of you who are worried that we're going to tell you that this systemic event is going to happen, we probably won't. But I will be echoing in a quantitative manner many, much of what you just heard talked about on the stage today with our panel. So these measures are very, very uh, useful. Um, and there are a plethora of them in the literature. Uh, my discussant has written a paper as well discussing some of the uh, risks that can, I mean, some of the measurements of systemic risk. Uh, but these quantitative metrics, although useful, do have a couple of drawbacks. First one is that they often are very general in nature, so we don't really know what's driving the elevation of risk. They may be capturing an elevation, but we don't know the underlying source. And the second one is some of these, for example, if you're talking about things like liquidity, you need to know the source of the risk in order to measure whether or not it's emerging. So we wanted to look to see if whether we could crowdsource both bank and investor information production to see if we could understand better when risks are emerging in the economy and to also be able to say something about what those risks might be. Let me just give you a preview of what we find. We find that we have three different levels of our, our research. The first is an aggregate risk measure, which is similar in spirit to those quantitative risk metrics that we spoke that I just spoke about. Uh, and we find out that risk starts to become elevated early in 2005, well before uh, the financial crisis occurs. Of course, uh, we do show that some of the specific risks that are becoming elevated are those that are known now to have contributed to that crisis. More importantly, it doesn't matter what happened in the last crisis if the next crisis is going to be quite different. And so we are going to present to you a dynamic model that looks at the types of risks that may be building uh, more rec recently. And then finally, we're going to be able to provide you with a, uh, a characteristic of individual banks that will predict their returns and uh, their potential failure. Right, so that's the roadmap of where we're going. We require that both banks and investors produce information in order for our method to work. So bank production is fairly easy. We're going to use 10K disclosures where banks are required by law and regulation to discuss the risks that are facing banks. Now, the, the problem with just using only bank disclosure is that sometimes the SEC may require institutions or firms to disclose risks that have no bearing on the risk of the financial sector. So uh, you can imagine that from Dodd-Frank, I worked on conflict minerals. 
a disclosure on conflict minerals may or may not actually be a risk associated with the, with the financial sector if, if or with the firms uh, more generally. So in order to assess the importance of those particular risks, we're going to use information production by their trading behavior, right? And we're going to use the covariance of returns to look at the commonality of trading for banks that are exposed to similar risks. We're going to have two versions of our model uh, because identifying these risks are very, very difficult to do, as you can imagine, and they involve trade-offs. So the first trade-off is, is that we're going to propose a static model in which we examine the output of a textual analytic program to determine what risk we should be looking at and tracking over time. And then we're going to have a fully dynamic model that's much more granular and picks from a lot of different topics to do it. And you'll see the trade-offs that we make in each one of those. So one has a higher t human touch than the second does, but there's some benefits from each. So as most of you are familiar, the, the 10K has a number of sections that describe the business. We look throughout the 10K and pick up any section that has the word risk in it. So we're not using the whole 10K, only paragraphs that have the word risk. And our data is from a vendor called MetaHeuristica. This is our third, my third paper with Jerry, and we have in the past had to parse all of these documents ourselves. Uh, it is not an easy task, and so we were fortunate through the grant to be able to get a vendor to do it for us. Right, so the first technique we're going to use is called Leighton Dirichla allocation. I'm not so sure about the middle name. I've heard it said many, many different ways. We're just going to call it LDA just to be safe. And this is a method of topic modeling where you can pick out sort of the words that authors are using around a particular topic. So if when you're having conversations out in, uh, you know, having coffee and having conversations, you might talk about your summer vacation, you may talk about your work, you may talk about the book that you read. And if we were to topic model across all of this, hopefully we would get a bunch of words that would talk about your vacation, you know, the beach, the mountains, whatever, a bunch of words that talk about your work, and a bunch of words that would talk about, what was the third thing I said? Uh, books that you read, okay? So um, that it's, a, it's a way of taking words and putting them into different bags, okay? So the only thing that LDA requires from me, the researcher, is how many topics do I want it to look for? So you can specify any topics, and there are some algorithms that will help you pick the appropriate number of topics, but that's all that we do. We say, we, and in this case, we look at 25. We do robustness around that. It's not so important, and I'll show you why in a moment. Right? So this is a, 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 another way of figuring out what writers do. So you know, we read a 10K. We're going to be finding topics that are around mortgage risk, capital requirements, et cetera. And then when you open that bag up, you're going to have subtopics within that particular bag. Right? So it is the probability that this is what the topic represents. So you don't need to know what this says. This is hard to read, and it's on, of course, on the web, and you can take a look at it. But this is the initial output. We get a much bigger output. But this is sort of representative of what LDA is. It's a series of topics. In this case, there are 25 boxes up there. The larger the box, the more important the topic is over the time period measured. So if it's in a year, over one year or five years or whatever the case may be, within each box is a series of words that best describe that topic. There are some really great things about LDA. LDA does not require that I do anything. It will tell me what those topics are. There are some drawbacks to LDA, though. And the first one is, is the topic is not always interpretable. So here's one that's very interpretable. So this topic has as its first bigram, which is a two-word uh, phrase, its first phrase is real estate. Its second phrase is loan portfolio. And its third phrase is real estate loans. All right, it goes on to say commercial real estate, commercial loans, secured real estate, mortgage loans. I think we might all agree that this topic is talking about real estate. 
so that's a pretty easy one. I think that you know, if we throw this out to the vast majority of people in this room and we sampled you, you would say, this is real estate. We're good to go. This is a topic that's not so interpretable. All right? The first word, the first bigram is fair value. Then it goes to interest rate. It has rate risk, financial instruments. Hmm, not so sure what this topic is. Now, I could make a guess, and I could put a title on this, but you might disagree with me and say, no, 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 you're crazy. That's the worst one ever. I see something else. So what we don't want to have, if we can help it, in a perfect world, we'd have no human intervention in the, in the determination of these topics. Because we may see things very differently, and we don't want to have our own bias imposed upon the types of topics that we see. Right? So the first problem is, is the topics are not always interpretable. The second problem is, is that we have 14 different years of topics. And that box that I showed you that came from Metaheuristica, it'll be populated every year in a different way. What's in the first topic may not be anywhere else in any other year. So I can't follow topics through time. I can't say, look, here's the real estate topic. I want to know, as we heard from the, the panel up, up here, people are concerned about real estate. How do I know about the risk of real estate, the disclosure, and the investor trading? How am I going to follow that? So we have going to implement this using a second stage. And this is called semantic vector analysis. So this is uh, a form of distributional semantics where the word is characterized by the company it keeps. One application of this semantic vector analysis is the Microsoft, they have a Microsoft sentence challenge, which is like the Turing test for natural language processing. What they want to know is, is, will your algorithm be able to fill in a word given a sentence? So they give a thousand sentences, and they give, for each sentence, they give five choices. How well does your algorithm predict what word should go in that sentence? And these guys from Google, they're Google uh, uh, linguistics, uh, were able to predict fairly well what sentence would go into that, uh, what word would go into that sentence. So that's the company it keeps. We go in the opposite direction and say, given a word, what would be all the sentences around it? Right? So that's where we care about. So it goes in both directions. Right? So the, there are two stages to this. All the 10Ks are loaded. You look to see what is a, a, a single word. We're going to predict a single word given its immediate surroundings. And then we're going to predict words surrounding a single word. And it outputs a vector of words. So if I put in the topic real estate, out will come a vector of words where real estate is being discussed. What that allows us to do is to say, look, we're going to take a, a, the topics from the LDA. So we're not going to make up any. You could make up some, and I'll talk about that in a moment. We're going to take the output from LDA. So in that real estate one, the first topic was real estate. We're going to feed it back in through this semantic vector. And we're going to get words that look like this. So you'll see, obviously, real estate, foreclosure, property, personal. These are words that are used around the discussion of real estate. The second thing we're going to do is you look at deposits. So you can see these are deposits, broker deposits, et cetera that describe a particular theme that have been uh, found through this LDA. Now, the beautiful thing about LDA is for every one of those 25 topics I told you about, it scores the document. So every document or every bank or every financial institution or every firm has a scoring on how much do they discuss that particular topic. Unfortunately, once we feed it into the semantic vector to get what we want is a stable thing we can track through time, we have to go back and rescore our document. So what we look at is, given the vector that I just showed you of real estate, so that's a vector of words. We have a vector of words used in the prospectus that describe the risks of the firm. We look to see how close those two words are, those two vectors are. That's called cosine similarity. And we're going to use that to score our documents. So if you are discussing real estate uh, using all of the words in that semantic vector, your, your cosine similarity will be close to 1. And if you never discuss real estate ever again, 
your cosine similarity will be zero. So it's a nice bounded measure. And I can score every doc document, every bank, every institution, every firm, if you wanted to do firms, by how much they discussed the topic that we want. So that's the bank production. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about those topics in a moment, because we do it in two different ways. But we want to know how important those topics are. So bank disclosure occurs only once a year, but trading occurs on a, on a, a, a daily basis very continuously. So what we're going to do is look at how much uh, do investors trade or how influenced are investors trading on the risks that we have determined. So we're going to use the covariance of bank pairs to determine this. We're going to use a model that controls for the characteristics, the joint characteristics of all of the banks in our sample. And we're going to then include, as part of our measurement, the risk themes that we have identified, their joint pairing. And the argument is, is that if this risk is important, let's again talk about real estate. If real estate is important, it is going to increase the R squared when it's included in the model along with bank characteristics. If it isn't important, the R squared won't be improved and we won't need to worry about it. So that's how we're going to determine whether a risk is emerging or not, is whether its contribution to the R squared is significant. So we use a, a number of data sources that are very typical for uh, banking research. Uh, and again, I want you to remember that we, we do control for character, quantitative characteristics associated with the bank. And we get that data from call reports. Right, so the first method we do is this static risk method. So this static risk method is designed to say, here are fundamental risks associated with the banking sector, and can we track them through time? So to, in order to figure that out, we did a few things. We examined the LDA output that I showed you, those bigrams that I showed, to see which ones were the most frequent over the period that we have a sample. We then feed those most frequent bigrams into this SVA algorithm and get vectors for each one. We remove boilerplate because it, it's very uh, intensive, com computationally intensive to run SVA. So we remove boilerplate that seem fairly obvious. But you could put it in if you had enough um, um, computing space. So we also look at the academic literature. It's in the paper to make sure that we're actually capturing risks that uh, may be fundamental to the banking industry. Now, we're not saying that we have captured all the risks. And I'll show you in a moment that it's not necessary that we do, that it, the model is flexible enough to incorporate additional risks. We've, we have 61 topics that we come up with or themes that we come up with. Many of these are collinear, so we remove them and we end up with 31 of them. Here are the ones that we have. The list of those that are removed are also in the paper if you're interested. But as you can see, many of these are risks that are just fundamental to how the banking sector operates. The first thing we want to do is say, can we get a measure like everyone else, a quantitative risk measure that will show whether risk is building in the economy. In order to do this, we include all of our static themes in the covariance model. We run it, and then we take them all out. And if the difference in the R squared is significant, it means that risk is building. All right, so we're going to compare the model with the static themes and the model without them. So this is a, a representation of our, our quantitative aggregate risk measure. This, so this is very similar to many of the risk measures that uh, others have proposed, we do find a significant elevation in emerging risk in the second quarter of 2005. And for those of you who know something about SEC rulemaking, in 2005, the SEC required that all firms consolidate their risk discussion into Section 1A. We have rerun this using the risk discussion a year earlier, and we get similar results. So it's not, not driven by the new regulatory environment. And as you'll see at the end, risk disclosures tend to be fairly static uh, of, over time, can be very static over time. So they're not changing as much as the covariance is changing. We compare this to other risk metrics. So this is the VIX, 
We look at standard deviation of financial firms, and we also look at EPU, which is a, uh, a policy uncertainty index uh, by Baker, Bloom, and Davis. And again, their elevation does not occur well until the crisis is underway. Well, even if we know risk is emerging, the point of the projects is to say, well, which one of these risks are driving the results? Instead of including all 31 of the static things, we include one theme at a time in our covariance model. We look to see how R squared changes. And if the R squared change is elevated, we will then consider that risk uh, emerging. And the stronger it is being elevated, the more emerging it is. The most relevant theme is going to be real estate. So that's the top one. That has, we use z-scores, not t-statistics. The, the um, vertical axis goes to 300, which is just an, an astronomically high z-score. And you can see real estate is elevated, uh, if you look at it in the paper in particular, begins to get elevated well before the crisis is underway. Prepayment risk also, and commercial paper, credit cards, dividends, and operational risk are all highly elevated prior to the crisis. There are more, we just not, can't fit them all on here, but to say that we, we find um, significance on those topics which we would expect to uh, is the first set of validation that we'd like to have for any kind of risk model. Now we don't see elevation in rating agencies, and I put that up because it appears as if investors were not very concerned about rating agency actions, even though, as we heard from the panel, there were significant agency problems with issuer paid rating agencies. We do not see an elevation associated with that. We don't see elevations associated with counterparty risk, for example. And so uh, even looking at that, with larger banks, there's some more, there's a bit of a more of an elevation for county party risk, but it doesn't come up anywhere near the real estate. Well, that's all great and good, but that crisis is over, so we don't really care about that as much as we care about predicting the next one or trying to figure out what risk may contribute to the next one. I don't know when a crisis is going to happen. I don't know if one is. I'm a little worried after the discussion here that it's Tuesday, but be that as it may, we have the ability, we hope, to predict risks that may be emerging in a more recent period. So here are some things that are coming up. We have short, some short-term funding through cash. Real estate, again, even though it doesn't look as high as the crisis relative to all the other risks, it's still highly elevated. Uh, lawsuits appear to have been a big problem in the more recent ones. Uh, county party risk, taxes. We have uh, taxes are not surprisingly. And again, our catch-all operational risk is again highly elevated in a more recent period. So there's ways to look at this that will help regulators, we hope, sort of decide where to put their prudential, uh, prudential supervisory resources. Now let's suppose you are a, a prudential bank examiner. You're in a bank, you see a problem, and you want to know if that problem may be more widespread or more important in a lot of banks. So one way that you can do that is by using what we call our drill down model. So you can include any user identified risk in the model to determine whether or not that risk is arising, assuming of course it's not collinear with the risks that are already there. So here's a drill down on the real estate theme. So the real estate theme has subprime, we put in mortgage backed, we have Fannie and Freddie, HELOC and foreclosed. So you do see some elevation uh, associated with subprime before the crisis and mortgage backed. We don't have much with Fannie and Freddie though, so that did not appear to be something that investors were particularly uh, worried about. Foreclosed is uh, highly elevated, and there's a blip in the HELOC. So it's another way of drilling down from these high level themes into more granular themes that can help the regulator or the researcher identify risks. Now, of course, we touch this, right, because we picked the 31 or 61 topics, so we're touching the risk. So the question uh, remains, can we also allow risk to rise dynamically where we don't touch it? 
So what we do is we take the output from LDA in every year. We take the top 25 terms. So that's 625 terms a year. We remove uh, anything that isn't a bigram, and we remove boilerplate. Now, instead of choosing between 31 themes, we're now choosing between 150 and 200 themes. We throw each one of those back into SVA. We see how each firm is loading on it. We put it in our covariance model. So very computationally intensive, but we do not touch the data except to remove boilerplate and, and, and common words. So we use a stepwise regression that adds the first most important theme, the second most important theme, et cetera, et cetera, uh, until we run out of themes. And so this is supposed to be uh, a method of looking at how risks are bubbling up without any intervention whatsoever. So these are some emerging risks in the, uh, I've highlighted a couple in red. We're not going to go through these very much. But you can see real estate and rate swap are pretty highly elevated uh, in 2005, very similar to our static model. Uh, once again, once a risk is elevated, because the baseline or threshold for that elevation becomes its past elevation, it's difficult for those risks to arise again, but some do. Uh, we see things like education loans, where uh, in 2011, there were some regulatory changes with respect to education loans. Those are bubbling up. We have weather events. I don't, didn't find 2013 to be a particularly difficult weather year, but apparently banks thought it was, and so weather events were a big deal. Uh, lots of things on regulation are also occurring through the time. So this uh, allows us to see, without any touching of the model at all, what is going on. Now, we can't, it's difficult to follow 150 different topics through time. So it's hard to track these over time. So this is used in addition to the static model. So last, what matters as well is what banks are going to be affected by risks. And so each of these banks have the loading on these risks. So that's one way the bank supervisor can look to see which bank has the most loading on real estate and to see if there's an issue. But we also want to know if their aggregate exposure to risk matters. So what we're going to do is we're going to predict the covariance of individual banks using their risk disclosures. And we're going to use that as an aggregate measure of emerging risk for an individual bank. And we're going to see whether we can predict three outcomes. One is the bank's stock return between nine, uh, September 2008 to December 2012 the bank stock return from uh, December 2015 to February 2016, and then finally, whether it failed within three years, beginning with the Lehman bankruptcy. We also look at volatility, which I probably will skip in the interest of my time here. So what we find is that on the, the second column is the, is the date at which the risk is measured, all right? So we find that as early as 2007, the first quarter of 2007, that we get uh, some predictive returns on the following two and a half years for these stocks. So the more highly exposed an institution may be to this emerging risk measure, the worse they perform over the next two and a half years. When we want to predict returns between 2015 and 2016, uh, in a more current period, and we're updating this data uh, soon, uh, we find that as far back as 2010 can predict what's happening in the more recent period. Finally, we want to predict bank failures. In order to do that, we find that risks, exposure to risk as early as 2005 in the third quarter can predict whether or not a bank will require assistance from the FDIC. Volatility is very strong throughout the, the sample. So to conclude, we are trying uh, to see if we can't crowdsource uh, large amounts of data from banks and, and investors about emerging risks in the uh, economy to see if we can determine what risks might be important. Uh, you know, this is a first time type of look. To our knowledge, no one has used this semantic theme or SBA before, and so we're trying very hard to see whether or not we can give regulators and researchers a blueprint 
for seeing how risk might, might bubble up and how they might be able to intervene before they become systemic. So this was a very interesting paper. I'm glad to have an opportunity to discuss it. I'll start with a one sentence summary of what I think is the key idea to take away from the paper. Commonality in the risks disclosed by banks in their 10Ks predicts co-movements in their stock returns. Why are we interested in that? Well, a corollary to that is that greater commonality in the disclosed risks potentially forecasts financial instability because that greater co-movement in the stock return might be many banks going down together. Interesting uh, finding is that important risks through this methodology get detected well in advance of the 2008 crisis. And I commend the authors for taking a stand on what are emerging risks today, as opposed to just looking back at uh, what was important in the past. And part of what's interesting about the paper is that the risks are identified using this novel application of natural language processing techniques. So that's sort of the main aggregate finding in the paper. There's also a kind of micro side to it, which is that for individual banks, greater exposure to these common disclosed risks predicts lower stock returns, higher risk of failure, higher stock price volatility. The paper's methodology is uh, it's very interesting. So the paper uses state-of-the-art topic analysis techniques. So what is a topic? Well, to the computer, a topic is just a cluster of co-occurring words. The computer doesn't know what, what the topic means. So what the algorithm, the LDA algorithm gives you back is just a, a collection of words that co-occur. And then interpreting and labeling the topics is a bit of an art. So as Kathleen showed, you have some easy examples. So uh, if you see words like foreclosure, property, deed, then you would probably label that like a real estate topic. Others are much less obvious. Uh, and it's, as I said, a little bit of an art form in figuring out what the topics actually mean that the algorithm has generated. There was some uh, earlier discussion on one of the panels before, some little bit of, uh, I think, healthy skepticism about the role of machine learning and AI in investment strategies. But I think this is exactly the sort of area where new tools are actually very useful. And that's dealing with unstructured data. So you really need these kinds of, there really is no alternative to using these kinds of techniques if you want to extract information out of uh, unstructured data. So I think that's a very valuable direction. Uh, in, in this topic analysis, the authors are very careful to let the algorithm speak, which is understandable and appropriate from a research point of view. I think if you were actually going to use this as a practical tool, it seems to me a little bit of human intervention in actually figuring out what the topics are and separating them. If you look, it actually, if you, if you look at some of the uh, topics, it, it, quite a few of them look like they are real estate related, which makes it even more difficult to, to sort out the differences. So having the computer propose alg uh, topics and having humans actually then sort them out might actually, from a, at least a practical point of view, might make this a more useful tool. But I think the most interesting question that the paper at, looks at is what is ultimately the information that's found in these disclosures in the 10Ks? It's unlikely that any one person actually read over 510Ks and extracted the each year. And this is exactly where new tools can help. So I think the interesting question to think about is, is the whole greater than the sum of its parts here? Is there something that the algorithm will extract by looking at 500 plus 10Ks that you wouldn't get as a human just by reading uh, a handful of them. The key finding is that the paper finds that important risks were known well in advance. And it seems to me that that, that rings true, that, that sounds right. I mean, there was a lot of angst about a housing bubble in 2005, for example, so as one simple indication, I just took a look at uh, Google searches over time for the phrase housing bubble, and that actually peaks in August 2005. Uh, and I think one of the frustrations, uh, you know, there are many discussions now on the 10-year anniversary of the Lehman failure, many discussions looking back at lessons learned. I think one of the frustrating aspects of trying to learn from the financial crisis is very hard to find anything that turned out to be important that wasn't known in advance and wasn't, in fact, widely discussed in effect. So there was no, there was no sudden surprise around the financial crisis. It, it, in some respects, it was more like a slow-moving train wreck. And so, in some sense, it's not that surprising to me that some of these topics actually emerge in the disclosures well in advance of the financial crisis. And that then, I think, invites the difficult question to think about, what if this paper had been available in 2005? So how would the world have gone differently, potentially, if this kind of technology had been available in 2005 and somebody had actually looked at what are the emerging risks? Unfortunately, I, I, I guess I kind of suspect, since many of these things were in fact known, the problem wasn't that the information wasn't available, it's nobody really knew how to act on the information. We can speculate on that, but there's really not very much that can be done from a research point of view. I want to ask a slightly easier question is, was the information already in fact known? 
And I'm going to ask that from a, a slightly different angle. So let's revisit what you could take as the paper's key question and answer. So you could phrase that in the following way. Can text analysis be used to forecast market instability? The paper's answer is yes, many months ahead. So Harry Mameski and I actually asked the same question in a different paper. Our paper is called Does Unusual News Forecast Market Stress? And we get the same answer. But we're using completely different text. So our papers are consistent and complementary, but in no sense in competition. We don't use 10Ks. We use the Thomson Reuters News Archive. So we look at news stories. And one of the things that's interesting to think about is what are the incentives for journalists? What are the incentives for the banks in disclosing in their 10Ks? And what's, what are the consequences of, the, of those differing incentives? But in any case, we, we are, we're using news stories. We use as our proxy for uh, financial stress, we just use it market, we look at market volatility, we look at single stock volatility, we look at market wide volatility. And we find that an increase in what we call unusual negative news. So we look at, we do a fairly standard sentiment analysis of the news text, but then we introduce also a measure of unusualness, and we find that it's not just important whether the news is positive or negative, but it actually it matters if it's unusual. When you have an increase in unusual negative news, that forecasts an increase in volatility several months ahead. So I think, again, very much in the spirit of, uh, of this paper. Two questions for both papers is, do the text measures forecast market variables? And for us, that's forecasting volatility. In this paper, the question is forecasting covariance of returns. The harder question is, is the information already in contemporaneous prices? Because I could have something that forecasts an increase in volatility, but that information may already be reflected in contemporaneous prices. Uh, if it is, then I've lost my forecasting ability. If it's not, then there's an inter interesting question of, well, why not? Why isn't that information already reflected in prices? So to address the second question, what we do in our paper is we control, sort of the obvious thing to do, we control for lagged volatility and negative returns. In other words, we control for known predictors of volatility that are already in market prices. And as you would expect, that takes away some of the predictability that you find in the text measures. Uh, particularly, we find less predictability remains at the single stock level than the aggregate level. And then this goes to the question of, well, if there is some predictability, if it's not full or fully uh, reflected in prices, why not? So our interpretation uh, of the fact that we find less predictability at the single stock level than at the aggregate level is that investors are quicker to incorporate information about individual stocks than they are about the aggregate market. And that's consistent with what Jung and Schiller call Samuelson's dictum, namely the idea that the market is micro-efficient but macro-inefficient. Why would that come about? Well, there are plenty of people watching an individual stocks, individual stock, and so if there's news that comes out that's relevant to that individual stock, people are going to act on it very quickly. If there's information about the aggregate market that's somehow uh, uh, spread out across individual news stories about individual stocks, that's less accessible to individuals. And you would expect that there's more of a chance that an algorithm is going to detect something that wouldn't have been readily available to individual investors. I guess I would ask the same question for this paper. The paper finds that these 10K disclosures forecasts covariance and stock returns. So commonality and risks predicts return covariance. Well, how does this hold up if we include lagged covariance as a predictor? So if people were, if, that, if those common risks were being absorbed in prices very quickly, then you would expect to see it already in contemporaneous covariances, and then those contemporaneous covariances would forecast an increase in future covariance. And the same question at the micro level. The paper finds that greater exposure to common risks forecasts individual bank volatility. What if we include lag volatility? We know la volatility is persistent. How much of that information that, that was captured through the 10K disclosures was already reflected contemporaneously in volatility? Now, my expectation would be that that would reduce some of the forecasting power of the paper. But that said, I think that doesn't, that doesn't take away from the interest and, and significance of this perspective, because as Kathleen mentioned, it's not just, it's not just, you're not just interested in forecasting. You want to understand where the increased covariance is coming from. So the topic analysis of the risks is useful, even if the forecasting power is reduced, because it provides a narrative. It doesn't just provide a forecast. It tells you where the increased risk is coming from. And the title of the paper has dynamic interpretation in it, which I think is appropriate. You're not just trying to forecast co-movement. You're trying to understand where it comes from. And, and that's, that's, I think, a valuable feature that you get out of the topic modeling that you wouldn't get out of just an ordinary regression.
I had a couple of uh, just minor uh, additional questions. So the analysis treats its 500 to 700 banks equally. It might be interesting to do some sort of size weighting of the analysis. So we may be interested in what risks are common to five to 700 banks, but we might also be concerned about what are the common risks that are common to just the five, top ten, five to 10 top banks. And in particular, trading-related risks don't show up in this paper, and I think that's because the paper's looking at this larger group and not focusing, not giving greater weight to the, the largest banks. Uh, but it might have been nice to pick up something about trading-related risks. With so many small banks, I was actually surprised to see that none of the topics that show up, at least the ones that I could see in the paper, none of the topics that show up in the paper pick up like a regional effect. I would imagine that with a lot of small banks, one of the topics that the computer would somehow find would be, would somehow suggest some sort of regional phenomena or a regional industry like energy, something like that would show up as a topic, but I didn't see that. And one final thought, for larger banks, it might be interesting to see the response in five-year CDS spreads as well as quarterly stock returns. Maybe there are some risks as being, that are seen as having a long-term consequence that don't necessarily show up in the next quarter's covariance. So there's, those are just a few minor questions overall. I think it's a very nice paper. It combines methodological innovation in dealing with unstructured data, clearly explained. Uh, new, for, new perspective on forecasting financial instability, and I, I think the paper should be of interest to academics, pr practitioners, and regulator. It's a useful addition to the suite of systemic risk indicators. How do you think about false positives uh, in this, and especially when it comes to regulatory use? I mean, our regulator, re regulators have limited budgets and time and, and all the rest, so how does this not become an exponential problem for them? I think that's a, a good question. You know, anytime you're trying to forecast, this is always the problem. You have fault, you, you know, when you, when you do risk assessment, right, you either, you have both type one and type two errors, right? And you can't get away from them. Uh, false positives, I suppose, don't worry as much as, you know, not capturing something because we envision this as being a tool that bank examiners might use when they go into banks, right? So they would easily figure out a false, we would hope, would figure out a false positive. Okay, um, so that, it, it doesn't worry me. I, I'm not expecting a banking regulator to say, oh, Hoberg and Hanley and Hoberg have found, you know, X, Y, Z is the factor. We now need to do some rulemaking. It was more to guide sort of where would you look for risks. And I think, you know, it takes human intuition. This is only machine learning can only take you too far so far. And you need to use your understanding of the industry and the data you're getting. Of course, there's a million data points they have that we don't have that can help give more precision around what we're showing here. So I, I'm not so worried about So, so you envision a bionic model where they're armed <laughs> with the technology and they go in. They're not, they're not chasing noise. Well, we would hope they wouldn't chase noise. We're trying to make it tractable, though. So where should they be looking? Um, and so a false positive is fine because they can rule that out, I think. I hope. You know, how much can banking regulators do? As, as Paul said, you know, these were known. Are we shocked by the results that we have for the crisis? No. But we, they can't say you didn't know and you didn't do something about it, or you, maybe they can't do something about it. I think it's very hard. How do, you, how do you cool down a housing market? I don't know. I have no idea how you do that. I couldn't make out the details on your chart with respect to the emerging um, issues coming up, but one I was concerned about is energy, specifically the U.S. shale uh, oil companies. Um, of the top 30 producers, only six made money over the last um, calendar year, and of those six, return on investment has been significantly lower than would be anticipated for a standard oil operation. Um, Interest rates are going up, the feds are tightening, a lot of the financing is coming from Wall Street private equity firms as well as other financial institutions and they're being pressured with dramatically increased costs in sand, water, um, oil service companies as well as transportation. Um, is, is this becoming a red flag um, uh, on, on your system and if so, to, to what extent? So we don't focus on any sector outside of financial institutions. But you bring up an interesting point that was actually brought up to us under the review process, the academic review process, where our referee pointed out this methodology could be applied to things like energy companies specifically uh, to figure out what risks are in any particular industry. This is not unique 
to the financial industry, but certainly we don't look at the in energy sector. It doesn't appear as if financial institutions are all that worried, though, uh, though, as I said, you could apply this elsewhere. So I'm sorry I don't have any prediction for you on the energy sector. So a question about the operational risk. You kind of you indicated that um, there's sort of a catch-all, yeah. and I think we've seen a lot of concentration in service providers and things like that. I mean, is there anything that the regulators can actually do to maybe help disclosure in that area? Because it seems like it's an interesting area that should probably be looked at, given that it was kind of a flag a decade ago and a flag today. Yeah, I don't, the, the SEC regulators obviously don't have uh, a specific one. But the nice thing about uh, this vector is that that's just a catch-all. And there are, we can show you if, you, if you're interested, we can show you all the components of that operational risk. And there will be more detail with respect to that. We also have representative paragraphs that talk about that type of risk so you can get a better sense of what that should be and how more granular it should be as far as the topic goes. I was wondering if you could define how um, the unusual story, how do you define unusual? So we look at um, the frequency of occurrence of, uh, we happen to look at four word phrases, but the frequency of occurrence of text uh, in, in the current month relative to what you've seen in a sliding window of two years. We lag that sliding window by three years. So uh, there are certain phrases that have negative sentiment, but they occur often. Um, an example of a, uh, a very unusual negative phrase that the algorithm detects in September 2008 is the collapse of Lehman. So, the, so not only is that a negative phrase, but it's a phrase that the algorithm has never seen before, and so it stands out as negative and unusual. You indicated that this was computationally complex. So for, for either of you, are these type of analyses possible to do in real time? Or what type of time are we talking about? No, I, I think that you know while we are doing this as a research paper, it's absolutely uh, available in real time. And in particular, the sum, if you're doing this in real time every time uh, a 10K comes out, you may not need to do the second stage, right? Because you can look at the topics in LDA, you can see what's going on with them, and you can get a, a pretty good idea of what those topics are. And then you can run the covariance model to see if it's been, uh, if it's, if it's in uh, rising through investors. So uh, it can definitely, LDA, you can get off Python script. Uh, there's a Python program for LDA. Uh, Jerry has just now put the semantic vector on a, on a PC, has figured out a way to do it. We've been using the Amazon cloud to do it because it's a neural network, but uh, he's been able to, to put it on a, on a powerful PC and get it to run. So yeah, uh, we're learning, okay, because this is all new to us too, so we're learning and we're trying to refine it so it can be used. Because of NSF, we'll be putting all this up on our website so you can track it as well. I was wondering to what extent is risk aversion among the banks driving some sort of a, uh, uh, of hurting in risk terminology that they're discussing in the 10Ks. So I don't know the 10Ks as well as obviously you do, but I'm wondering to the extent that there is a common theme and, and people want to make sure there's no litigation risk, uh, and they will discuss it in some form. Is your apparatus able to tell it in, to what extent the risk is real for the particular entity? And hence you get uh, this commonality in, in risk discussion that ultimately leads to what you're, what, you're, uh, what you're discovering, or is this more of a, of a litigation risk concern that the banks have, and hence discuss certain topics? So this is a, a good question. This is the reason why we need to use some sort of investor production of information as well as banks. Because if we just use banks alone, this is exactly what might happen. We'll get hurting on banks. We'll get. Uh, we'll get uh, a lot of um, disclosure that may only be trying to reduce litigation and not something that is actually meaningful from an economic perspective. So if banks are hurting on many risks that are not important to investors, then those just fall out of our model and they go away. They, you won't see any elevation in them because they're not important. Okay? So there have been a lot of changes in the types of risk people have had to disclose or the, and banks have had to disclose. You know, we don't, you won't pick them up if, if it's just boilerplate, like forgot to take out something that was boilerplate. Uh, it's just not going to bubble up because investors won't trade on that and it won't matter.